SCP-3667. All's well that ends hell. While it's my usual nature to give some sort of lengthy preamble to introduce the article to you, perhaps with some slight philosophical musings, I think for this one the title is enough to get you interested, as the Foundation finds a portal to hell and does what they do best. Let's begin. SCP-3667 is an extra-dimensional anomaly located in a sinkhole at the bottom of a diamond mine in the Republic of Sakha in Russia. Radar and other imaging techniques don't show anything unusual below the mine, but the sinkhole contains a Leibniz-class spatial anomaly, meaning that it's created and sustained by a shared belief. The anomaly is 5 kilometers wide at its widest point, and 6 kilometers at its highest point, consisting of a subterranean network of caves and passages. This network contains a variety of stone structures and complexes, usually crudely built, and a variety of mostly wooden machinery designed to imprison and or torture humans, or humanoid figures. Also present are around 12,000 anomalous human beings, most of which are suffering from varying degrees of psychological stress, and 24 unique species of sapient and largely anomalous entities, all of which display hostility to humans, especially those of Russian descent. The sinkhole leading into 3667 was formed in 2010, during a routine drilling operation at the mine. The resulting cave-in killed at least one worker and injured several others. Some of the workers proceeded to explore the cave system, identifying some of the stone structures and possible human remains, but while attempting to contact their superiors, one of the hostile entities emerged from the sinkhole and immolated them. The winged creature then proceeded to attack the nearby town of Murney, resulting in dozens of police calls which were picked up on by the Foundation. Fires spread across the town, and a number of buildings collapsed, slowing down the Foundation, and ground troops proved to be ineffective in subduing the entity. Seventeen MTF members were killed, either by immolation from the entity itself, or from falling debris, before a Foundation helicopter managed to take it down. Afterwards, the entire town was amnesticized, with the extensive fire damage attributed to a gas leak at the nearby Polytechnic Institute. Surviving mine workers and executives at the company were led to believe that the mine had ceased production in 2004, and was off-limits to the public. A surface-to-air missile system perimeter was established in anticipation for more entities emerging from underground, and the anomaly was classified as Keter class. So far, four more entities have emerged from the sinkhole, all of which were swiftly terminated. We're given some brief descriptions of some of the different species of entities located in the anomaly, starting with the species that initially attacked the town. This entity has the head of a dog, with large bat-like wings, standing around 3 meters tall, or close to 10 feet. It's covered in short, coarse fur, and continually exudes a flammable substance which it can ignite and use offensively. Captured entities of this species display rudimentary cognitive ability, forming complex social structures, and are able to recognize recurring patterns in abstract shapes. Another species is much shorter, and described as toad-like, with no respiratory or digestive systems instead possessing a large, spike-filled cavity which it apparently uses to transport captive humans between torture devices. A third species is an emaciated humanoid around 1.5 meters tall, with red-brown skin and an oversized head. These display human-level intelligence and speak modern Russian, offering subjects wealth and power in exchange for cherished personal objects. The entity doesn't possess any anomalous abilities, however, and once a bargain is struck, they will attempt to renegotiate for something readily available. 
Another species consists of 48 humanoids standing around 5 meters, or over 16 feet tall, with curved spines. They are covered in furs and wear oversized skulls of a variety of tundra animals, speaking Old Church Slavonic with a familiarity with modern Russian. They refer to themselves collectively as magistrates. Of course, we know what's next, as the Foundation sent in a brave MTF team to scout out the anomaly. The four-man team enters the sinkhole, causing all radio contact to cut out for three seconds. When it's re-established, the team is standing on the floor of a large cave, dimly lit from an unidentified source, with sounds of running water heard. Due to the frequency in which anomalies have possessed or replaced Foundation personnel during periods of interference like that, they each carry a device to measure any changes in baseline reality. They spend two minutes checking themselves, and everything is clear. So they look to see that the dimensional anomaly on this side looks to be an uneven hole in the air. They begin to move forward, stepping on what they initially thought were uneven rocks, but later proved to be bones, probably skull fragments. They continue moving towards the sound of running water, remarking on the terrible smell in the area. They eventually come across a wide stream, yellow-gray in appearance, and along with the sound of running liquid are a number of voices whispering in Russian, too layered and indistinct to make out individual phrases. The river apparently smells like rotten eggs mixed with blood mixed with vanilla for whatever reason. One of the team throws a small stone into the river, which doesn't seem to have any effect, so they take a sample of the liquid before crossing it. They note some unusual clumping patterns in the water and find some very uniform stones on the other side, broken off from a part of a nearby wall. They guess that the wall is a hundred or few hundred years old, as some of the bricks are disintegrating, and they ask Command if there's any primers on the chance that they encounter sentient life down here. Command tells them that they're not cleared for that, and for now they should just scout out the rest of the structure and then pull out. They enter into a ruin, passing through a hallway into a large circular room with a rock at the top where a hole to let light in should be. On the floor of the room is an elaborate but badly damaged mosaic depicting a variety of anomalous creatures, including some resembling the winged one that attacked the town. The entities are reclining over a system of red and yellow rivers alongside some small humanoid figures. They then see four more hallways branching further into the structure, so they split up, each taking one of the hallways, which, to be honest, seems more like the actions of a bad Dungeons & Dragons party than a proper MTF. Command tries to argue against the plan, but the team lead, Anna, insists, and tells Command to watch each of them like hawks. One of the team, Gregory, says that he feels like he's approaching an exit as he feels a breeze and indistinct noises can be heard in the background. He then suddenly switches his headlight off and begins whispering, saying that something is here. Command tells him to get back to the entrance, as they're pulling all of them out, but Anna tells him to stay where he is so she can come get him. Anna walks into the room with her headlight on, seeing Gregory crouched behind some rock. The two other members' headlights are also visible in some other hallways, showing that they all converge into this room. Gregory tells them to turn off their lights, as it knows that they're here. An entity then appears out of the far end of the cave, approximately 10 meters in height, with a feline appearance, and calls them sinners and foolish creatures, saying that they should have stayed in their cages. Anna tells Gregory to get out of there, but he says that he fell down a hill and he can't get back up. The entity says that they do not have the mark of Ognayana, and asks how they found their way to this place, since they should not be here. Command tells Anna to leave Gregory there and get the others out, as the entity advances towards Gregory. 
The entity says that he does not have the mark, so when he dies, he will not come back, and this is good. Gregory manages to pull a frag grenade out of his pack and throws it at the entity, who merely picks it up and swallows it. It tells Gregory that shiny baubles will not buy his life, assuming that it was some sort of treasure, but then the grenade detonates, swiftly killing the creature. Anna grabs Gregory and helps to carry him out, telling Command that he's got a twisted ankle and the feline entity is no longer a threat, now missing most of its head. The whole MTF manages to make it out, and portions of the feline entity are taken back for further study. The sample taken from the river shows that it features anomalous molecular structure and bonding sites, but it will actively bond to organic molecules to create a cubic lattice. Encouraged by the overall success of the first exploratory mission, the Foundation set up a base camp within the mine and sent in two more MTF teams to further map out the area and find out the source of the spatial anomaly. The teams are in good spirits going in, with one member remarking on them finding a whole lot of kitten kibble in there. Command says that they'll likely be in there for quite a while, so they hope that they brought their sleeping bags. They're authorized to terminate anything they find in there, and the Foundation isn't overly concerned about the level of danger from the entities here. The teams begin heading in a different direction than the first team, also remarking on the vanilla smell in the area. They're interrupted by a noise resembling a human scream emanating from deeper within the cave. They stay silent for a minute, but the noise doesn't repeat. They decide to try and track down whatever made that scream, and Command just tells them to stay sharp and go slow. They hear the scream again, from a greater distance away, noting that it could be a civilian that got dragged down here. They continue sweeping forward as the ceiling starts to drop, closing them in, and they come up to the edge of a large, shallow body of the same liquid from the river. Command says that they're still running tests, but it won't harm them to touch it. They pass through the liquid and come out the other side, where the ceiling rises again. Multiple noises can be heard here, including a repetitive scratching sound. Command doesn't want them getting lost, but they continue to poke around, finding a pile of something on the floor that looks like wood chips. One of them starts opening fire on something, afterwards remarking that it was likely a rat. The rat was inside of a large, intricate, circular wooden structure, with one side winched open, where rows of wooden spikes covered in a dark substance, presumed to be blood, are visible. The rat looked like it was adjusting parts before it ran away. They hear more noises resembling human whimpering coming from deeper within the cave, and one of the team leads advises a strategic retreat. They see more of the wooden structures of varying shapes and sizes across the cavern, all covered in large rats that are staring at the exploration team. They shoo the rats away, and then see several forms within the wooden structures, noting that there are bodies in some of them, probably civilians from town. They then see that one of them is still alive, and the exploration log ends. After some time, they ended up pulling out over 12,000 humanoid anomalies from the cave system, and relocated them to a nearby site. Most of them were taken out of various torture devices, but some were being transported within the large, toad-like entities. Some were found trying to flee the area, and some were being consumed by other entities. They all display anomalous, limited regeneration capabilities, in part due to the presence of the odd liquid from the cave system in their bloodstream. The Foundation has, of course, tried to put that liquid into others to try and replicate the regenerative abilities, but with no success, suggesting that it's just a catalyst for the humanoid's abilities. They are still killable, though, if you simply apply enough repetitive force to exceed their regeneration. 
Most of the humanoids are perfect physical and genetic matches for former residents of Murney within the last 50 years, while the others do not correspond with any known person, living or dead. All of them claim to have lived their whole lives within the anomaly, but the Foundation has found cadavers within the town that match some of the humanoids. Not everyone that lives in the town ends up with a copy in the anomaly though, as analysis of town records and the copies indicate that several criteria must be met. The resident's family must have lived within the town limits for at least two generations, and the resident must have been suspected of committing a crime, but must not have been convicted of said crime, such as arson, pedophilia, lechery, avarice, homosexuality, or paganism. Finally, with some exceptions, the resident must have been affiliated with or maintained close ties to the Light of Five Heavens Russian Orthodox Church and its founder, Sergei Guslikov a radical branch of the Orthodox Church that was excommunicated after Sergei's death. Over the following two years, 41 separate explorations were commenced into the anomaly, resulting in most of the interior being mapped out, and instances of every known species of entity being captured. On August 23, 2014, a 50 meter tall, or over 160 feet, pig-like entity emerged from the sinkhole and attacked the nearby camp, leading to three casualties and twenty severe injuries. The entity possessed regenerative abilities and what appeared to be an exoskeleton, so initial termination attempts were unsuccessful. The members of the camp retreated to the nearby SCP facility to wait for reinforcement and upon return found that the entity had destroyed most of the missile systems around the perimeter before moving to the area directly in front of the sinkhole. There, it was completely unresponsive to the Foundation's presence, allowing them to easily dispatch it with a round of drone strikes. The director of the nearby site and the Saka Republic Regional Administrator argued to the O5 Council afterwards that the entities within the anomaly represented a continued danger to both Foundation personnel and the people of the town of Murney. Therefore, they should make a coordinated effort to wipe out every hostile entity within the anomaly and attempt to secure the cooperation of any sentient instances where possible. This led to eight separate ethics committee hearings, as genocide isn't usually on the Foundation's itinerary, but the O5 Council finally approved the plan. A total of six MTF teams were sent into the pit of hell, with violent intent. They are supplied with some armored fighting vehicles equipped with anti-demonic kinetic and incendiary weapons and a translator to allow for communication between the Russian MTF and the English-speaking MTF, the Mole Rats. This is the Mole Rats first time inside of the anomaly, but they're well trained and familiar with dimensional anomalies, so they're not overly concerned. The plan is for each team to follow one of the major rivers where they are likely to find the larger entities and to clear it out from end to end. Unfortunately, this plan wasn't discussed with the Russian MTF, with the Mole Rats explaining that this is the best strategy if you want to keep it clean and quick. The Russians argue that they all grew up around this mine, they were here when things started coming out of it, and they've been down here more than 40 times, so they can handle themselves. The Mole Rats argue that this is what they get called in for, so they'll just have to trust them. They initially find only some rats, which they suspect are just normal rats, until they finally find an entity that looks like a skinny child with a big drooping head drinking out of the stream. They proceed to terminate it with extreme prejudice, and a mole rat asks if that one was sapient. Someone else answers that it was, but just barely, and they wouldn't lose any sleep over it. 
Another member says that they've been down here where they couldn't walk around without sneezing all over a colony of entities, but now the place seems empty. The team lead of the Mole Rats asks how many of the big rivers they've explored down here, with the answer being around 80%. There's three of them that they haven't, which are currently being traversed by three of the MTF teams. One of the teams had just reached the end, where it drains into a sinkhole that seems to have a shallow bottom. Another team scouted ahead to find that the river ends by going into a very small crack. The third team however found that the river flowed into a large cave, with bricks in the walls, bones and garbage present on the ground, and a couple torture devices with no people in them. They can also hear noises come from further ahead so all of the teams decide to converge on the cave. One of the team members at the cave remarks that the river looks different there, as it's bubbling, appears milkier white than before, and gives off a small amount of heat. When the others arrive, they try sticking a telescoping pole into the river, and when they pull it back out, the end is missing entirely. As one of the leaders is saying to stay away from the river, a large, leech-like creature drops from the ceiling of the cave and engulfs the upper torso of the mole rat's leader, who was standing closest to the river. Before anyone else can do anything, the leech flops into the river, dragging him with it. The leech appears to be immune to the river's effects, but his body and skeleton quickly melts into a thick white paste as they flow down the stream. The leech entity shakes itself free of the remaining skeleton and swims further down the river. The rest of the team proceed further into the cave, following one member that ran after the leech in anger. The surrounding environment begins to brighten as they move through, until they stop on a rocky outcropping. Approximately a kilometer ahead of them is a large complex of stone structures, several stories tall, containing enormous lit metal braziers. The complex straddles the river, and the teams watch as a complicated wooden device releases several humanoid entities into the river, where they quickly dissolve. An elaborate system of wooden walkways crisscrosses the river where a number of entities are perched. Massive, millipede-like creatures are seen periodically climbing between the river and walkways. The entities are all reaching into the river and extracting some liquid, which slowly solidifies into a humanoid entity which is then eaten, while others are excreting fully formed humanoids into the river where they quickly dissolve. One of the MTF leaders decides that they're going to finish this here and now, regardless of how many entities there are, so they begin pouring out the liquid, anti-demonic material into the river. An after-action report estimated that the introduction of this anti-demonic solution into the river system led to the termination of over 80% of the anomaly's native inhabitants, except for the humanoid entities. The leader that initiated the plan was subjected to internal review due to unorthodox actions taken in the field, but was ultimately commended instead. Three days later, 24 instances of a previously unidentified species of entity emerged from the sinkhole. While the MTFs present would have normally bombarded them back to hell, they decided not to immediately open fire due to one of the entities waving a stick with a large white cloth tied to it. A small contingent of MTF operatives, accompanied by the translator, went down to meet them. As they approach, one of the entities speaks in Old Church Slavonic, an old dialect that the translator can manage to understand. The entity asked if the translator is the one they bow to, if she is their queen, or just the messenger. The translator says that she is a representative of the Foundation, the people who've been exploring the caves, and she wants to ask them some questions. The entity says that the translator is a herald, 
but one who does not shake in fear, so they will treat with her. Another entity asks her where she would like to set their treaty. On wood, on stone, in the trees, or in music on the air. She asks what kind of treaty they're talking about, to which another entity responds that they would like to make an offering in order to be at peace. The translator asks what they're offering, to which they say, From the caverns of the Domovoi to the lands of laughter and sorrow, and all the sweet rivers that flow between, and all the creatures that live in those lands, those who have been marked by Ognaena and their shepherds, and they will provide their counsel and advice to the Foundation, who would be masters of this realm, to keep it safe and prosperous. They swear this on the bones of Kirnu Bo, and they will set it in writing wherever she wishes. They don't want anything in exchange, this is just their offering, as the Foundation came here to conquer, and they slew many of their warriors with weapons they do not understand. Now they come to offer up their land and their lives. The translator tells them that she needs to talk to her superiors. A couple of months later, the Foundation reached an agreement with the entities, giving control of the anomaly to the Foundation in exchange for limited autonomy within the anomaly and freedom from arbitrary termination. A new site was constructed within the anomaly to directly study the anomaly and the entities, and a research complex is currently under development, named after the fallen Mole Rats member. Upon the recommendation of the entities, and confirmed by the Foundation's own studies, several steps have been taken by the Foundation to ensure the continued stability of the anomaly. The ruler of the anomaly must have an honorific that accurately represents both the anomaly itself as well as the belief system of the individuals that created it. Therefore, after careful consideration, the director of the site within the anomaly has been given the official honorific of Director of Hell, which will be used in all official documentation. Additionally, entities within the anomaly have been granted permission to perform a variety of other rituals in order to ensure its continued stability. After some years go by, the research department head of the humanoid entities at the site, with the honorific of Eater of Fire, declares that the only anomalous ability possessed by the humanoid entities is their regenerative ability. Given the enormous material cost required to maintain them, he declares that the Foundation is disbanding his department, and relocating all of the humanoid entities to classified locations to allow them to reintegrate into society. In another email, however, from the director of the site in the anomaly to a couple other site directors, she says that last month they discussed the dwindling supply of D-Class, and she said that she had none to spare. She's happy now to announce that something has come up to change that, and she'll be sending out a shipment of new D-Class next week. It isn't as many as they hoped for, but these ones will withstand most anything they throw at them. She hopes that they're able to put them to good use, and signs off the email with her official title, Director of Hell. All in all, this whole situation could have been far worse for either side. The Foundation managed to lose only a handful of people, and they decided not to completely wipe out every last entity within the anomaly. Sure, they decided to continue the practice of torturing these poor human copies in the name of research, but as they say, never let some regenerating humans pulled out of a portal to hell go to waste. 